All right, I will get us started here. Good evening, everyone. I am Adam Joyce. I am on the board of the Institute for Christian Socialism. This event is a partnership between the Institute for Christian Socialism and the Wendland Cook Program in Religion and Justice. We are so excited for tonight and want to say thank you so much for joining us for this panel conversation. Before we pass it over to the panel, Gabby Lissy and I from Wendland Cook will provide brief introductions to each of our organizations. So the Institute for Christian Socialism exists to support the followers of Jesus in confronting the world's captivity to capitalism and in claiming, embodying, and promoting the radical socialism of the gospel. We are all about building an ecumenical movement of the Christian left and equipping individuals and churches with the theology, tools, and conversation to both resist the oppressive degradations of capitalism and build just alternatives. We have two main programs, The Bias Magazine, which publishes distinct and radical ecumenical pieces on politics, culture, economy, and the environment. If you're interested, you can pitch pieces to The Bias. I will drop the link in after this. And we also have our membership community, which is a community of Christian socialists who are dedicated to mutual political education and building power and solidarity with one another. I will also drop the link to our membership program in afterwards as well. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight, everyone, and I will pass it over to you, Gabby. Hi, my name is Gabby. I use she, they, and he pronouns. Uh, I'm a communications director for the Wendland Cook Program and Religion and Justice at Vanderbilt. Um, our program was established in 2019 by Dr. Jorg Rieger and is generously supported by Barbara Wendland. It's, we are dedicated to exploring the intersections of religion, economics, and ecology. Our mission is to develop resources and opportunities for students, scholars, clergy, activists, all with the shared goal of envisioning and creating a more just and sustainable world for everyone. One of our main programs is Solidarity Circles. In today's world, faith leaders, clergy, and organizers often feel isolated and underconnected. And this is where Solidarity Circles comes into play. These virtual peer networks are tailored for faith leaders, organizers, clergy, and community members interested in the cooperative solidarity economy. We aim to break down isolation barriers. It's our way of revitalizing and building positive change within the church and their surrounding communities. We firmly believe that this work is intricately connected to the mission and vocation of Christian churches, addressing economic inequalities, white supremacy, and gender and sex inequalities. We're also excited to introduce our new podcast, Religion and Justice, hosted by George Schmidt, a PhD student at our program, and myself. Uh, in each episode, we'll delve into the intersections of class, religion, labor, ecology, uncovering their implications for justice. It's not just a podcast, though. It is a space for investigation, education, and organizing. We invite you to join us as we engage in discussions with experts, working people, theologians, all fostering dialogue for actionable change and together we can navigate religion, justice, and solidarity for a more equitable future. Because our program is attached to Vanderbilt University Divinity School, we also offer academic programs, and we invite you to check out our website, religionandjustice.org, for all of the above information. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adam, and thanks so much, Gabby. Um, incredibly excited for tonight's conversation. Uh, my name is Reverend Andrew Wilkes. Uh, tonight's uh, discussion is entitled uh, The Impossibility of Solidarity on the Left. It is a rich and verdant uh, paradox that I hope is pushing us to discussion and to uh, constructive and transformative action. Uh, I could not be more thrilled for uh, the Wendling Cook Program uh, for Religion and Justice at Vanderbilt's Divinity School. Uh, and the Institute for Christian Socialism to be having this conversation. I just want to say a few ground rules. Uh, we'll do some wraparound introductions, and then we'll dive right on into it. Uh, tonight's conversation is grounded and undergirded by uh, uh, Dr. George uh, Rieger's text, uh, Theology in the Capital, Capital Low Scene, uh, Ecology, Identity, Class, and Solidarity. Uh, if you don't have the text, I encourage you to get it. Uh, and if you do have the text, and I feel very Baptist right here, 
uh, I invite your attention to chapter four, which will ground our conversation for tonight. Uh, we have over 160 registrants, uh, which I think is a sign of the justice hunger and the need for this kind of discussion. Uh, and with that, um, two more additional logistical items. Uh, the first is we want to hear from you all. Um, the more interaction, the more engagement we have, uh, which we direct to the Q&A portion of the Zoom room, uh, the richer and the more actionable our conversation will be. So we invite you to lean in that way. Uh, and then also you can lean in via the chat. Uh, so let's uh, introduce ourselves and get acquainted. Um, I'll give it to you, uh, yours, to uh, introduce yourself, uh, and then um, Angela. Yeah, thank thank you, Andrew, for um, getting us going here. And thanks to Adam and Gabby, the Institute for Christian Socialism and, and the Wendell and Cook Program working together is something that uh, we had envisioned uh, for quite a while. We've done it in the past. We're doing it again now. So um, I'm Jörg Rieger. I'm a theologian. Uh, theology professor at Vanderbilt Divinity School and Vanderbilt University. Um, my work is on issues of religion and power. And um, with that, I've done work on colonialism, post-decolonialism, and so on. Um, but more and more realizing that uh, a lot of what colonizes us these days is the power of money. So the, the recent book is this book, Theology in the Capital Scene. It's sort of a small manifesto trying to write the shorter books that people actually read, uh, hopefully. And um, in this book, uh, I'm, I'm pulling together a lot of things uh, I've done in the past. This whole question of solidarity is coming back. Question of class analysis is coming back, but really always intersectionally. So this is not a question of class versus race or versus gender, but really how does it all come together? And not just as a mere addition saying, well, we need this and that and the other, but how do these things shape each other? Uh, and of course, the Capitolo scene here is this geological age in which we find ourselves. So the basic thing here is to say, uh, we're not living in the Anthropocene, as many people claim. That's sort of covering up the fact that while there are a lot of human beings that are indeed shaping the planet as Anthropocene proponents say, uh, it is the Capitalism because not always uh, all human beings are doing this shaping in the same way and with the same consequences. And of course, that's the problem, um, but there's also this solution that comes through recognizing what we're up against and building power accordingly. So that's sort of my work at the moment. Uh, I direct, I founded the Wendling Cook Program in Religion and Justice, where these are some of our questions. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about the actual things that we're doing, like the solidarity circles that Gabby already mentioned, uh, because that's very practical. We also have blog series uh, and webinars and so on, uh, things that you can watch. Religionandjustice.org is our website. So thanks. Beautiful. Angela? Thank you. My name is Angela Kauser, and I um, am from Memphis, Tennessee. I'm in Memphis right now with my mother. Uh, I grew up in racial segregation in the 1960s, uh, was here in 1968 when Dr. King was assassinated. Uh, so I was a uh, watcher of the, the Poor People's Campaign and the sanitation worker strike uh, here in Memphis, which is what brought Dr. King to this city. I am, um, I wear three hats vocationally. I am uh, an organizer with the Industrial Areas Foundation, which is the oldest uh, community organizing network in the United States. I am uh, a pastor, minister of word and sacrament ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA. <clears throat> and I'm a social, I identify as a sociologist of religion. I'm trained as an ethicist, but I really work as a sociologist of religion. My areas of work right now are very practical. I work with congregations, primarily Methodist in East Ohio to test out a new model of congregational renewal and revitalization. And people may ask, well, why in the world would you try to revive congregations? Because congregations are important for, for solidarity. Uh, they're important for formation of human beings from birth to death and arguably even life beyond death. 
they are important for shaping an alternative consciousness to capitalism. Um, they are important as sites of economic reproduction and production. And I think they therefore uh, need attention. And so that's where I have spent the last three years of my life in research. Um, I also research repentance uh, because for me, that is the key turn uh, in the gospel for Jesus. And he says it fairly early on and then lives it out for the, for the remainder of, of the gospel narratives. Uh, I am a board member of ICS and I'm very, very glad to be here with you tonight. Wonderful. Um, I could not be more thrilled again to just underscore that note of um, anticipation that brings us here. And once again, invite questions in the chat uh, or the Q&A function. Uh, so here's the flow for tonight. Uh, for about 45-ish minutes, um, Angela, George, and I will start off a kind of fireside chat by talking first about the problems of solidarity. How do we achieve it? How do we sustain it? Um, is all solidarity good solidarity? Next, we'll turn to the distinction and the potential possible overlap between solidarities organized around privilege and solidarities organized along the lines of power. Uh, and then we'll conclude by talking about what it looks like to engage in deep solidarity. And again, we invite you to help us co-create this conversation. We want you to lean in and help uh, paint on the canvas together. Uh, and then after that 45-ish minutes, we'll then go to about 20 minutes of dedicated uh, Q&A time. Uh, so without further ado, and with great enthusiasm, let's dive into this question of thinking through the problems of solidarity together. Uh, tonight's title and perhaps the lived experiences of many of us in advocacy and organizing uh, suggests that realizing solidarity uh, can feel almost impossible at times. Uh, so that's one challenge. But but then there's another challenge that, that George invites us to lean into, and that's uh, perhaps that all solidarity is not necessarily good solidarity, that every time folks coalesce together, that doesn't necessarily mean we're tilting towards more equity, more justice, uh, more even distributions of, of power. And so George, we'd love for you to kick us off um, by leaning into how you see some of the problems of solidarity. Uh, thanks, Andrew. That's probably a good place to start, right? Because uh, we usually think solidarity is a good thing and uh, maybe we should have more of it. But uh, let me start by saying solidarity is really a battleground. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, uh, on the one hand, the dominant system realizes that solidarity is extremely dangerous. You know, if we're thinking about the majority of um, humanity not benefiting from the system, you know, that was the old Occupy Wall Street slogan, we are the 99%, and that may be not precise class analysis, but it's the reminder uh, that the people who are not winning here are really always in the majority. So, so if that happens, uh, if there is an awareness of solidarity among the right people, uh, that's, of course, very powerful. And so there's all kinds of efforts uh, I would argue, uh, to actually distract us and to build false solidarities. Um, so, for instance, uh, you know, uh, there's an old story uh, that the uh, African-American historian Lerone Bennett tells of, uh, you know, in his book Before the Mayflower, where you have in Virginia, uh, 17th century Virginia, black sharecroppers and white sharecroppers. And... Um, well, uh, they work together in the fields. And so solidarity here is something that's almost naturally forming because they're going through the same issues. They're going through the same forms of exploitation. The masters are beginning to realize the danger of this. Uh, you know, with these sharecroppers getting together, uh, this could be really problematic. And so what the masters are doing is um, the old divide and conquer trick, right? So they're basically dividing white and black sharecroppers. Uh, and here privilege is important because the white sharecroppers are actually getting something out of it. So the white masters, uh, you know, give them little favors, you know, they remind them that ultimately they have more in common with the white masters, the white sharecroppers have more in common with the white masters than with the black sharecroppers. Uh, and so gradually, uh, this whole idea, uh, you know, of the white race and white racism, white supremacy emerges. 
uh, where white people then uh, believe they have more in common with other white people. Now, that's a form of solidarity uh, that's extremely powerful and uh, the consequences of which we're still seeing. You know, this is powerful in politics. Uh, this is how the right wing always wins. You know, uh, you could tell stories of fascism, you know, in my, my own German background, if you think about German nationalism uh, in the Third Reich, uh, that was really all about the same thing, right? Uh, dividing Germans uh, from other people, making Germans think they have more in common with Germans uh, than with British people or people from France or America. Uh, while in reality, of course, uh, that's not necessarily what's going on. So, so in the book, I actually talk about this as unite and conquer. This is that false solidarity that unites people, not just divide and conquer. We know this, but unite and conquer is bringing people together under these false premises. So, so white supremacy, for instance, then is uh, uniting white people, of course, in order to conquer everybody who is not white, but also uh, to conquer uh, almost everybody who is white uh, because the 1% ruling class uh, is not interested in sharing white supremacy, uh, their supremacy with all white people. And so white supremacy here conquers ultimately um, most white people also uh, who think uh, that this thing is actually in their benefit uh, and to benefit to some degree, no question. It's like these white sharecroppers. They benefited to some degree from the master's actions, uh, but they were never on the same level and never meant to be on the same level as the white masters. This is something that uh, Kianga Yamata Taylor also points out in her book from, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, Black Lives Matter. To, uh... Yes, from Black Lives Matter to Black Solidarity, I, I think something like that. Uh, uh, and uh, the basic thing here is um, there is these false solidarities. Uh, race functions this way. Gender often functions that way. It's used that way by the dominant powers. It's not just an accident that it happens. Uh, nationalism functions, but let, let's be very clear because we're also talking religion here. Religion also functions that way. And so Christians are oftentimes fooled thinking they have more in common with other Christians. Uh, and this is very well used these days on the right. You know, this is why politicians talk about God, uh, because they want to fool people thinking we people talking about the Christian God automatically by necessity have more in common with each other. So, so this is part of this false solidarity that unites and conquers. That's all built on sameness. That's all built on identity. Uh, and what I'm arguing in this fourth chapter is uh, this is one solidarity uh, that has been detrimental throughout history. Uh, and there's an alternative. So, so this is the exciting thing. This doesn't have to be that way. There's something that could actually be built and that is sometimes being built on the left. And we can look at what that is. I start the chapter, by the way, just one more comment uh, with... Sure quote that's attributed uh, to Che Guevara once in a while. I'm not sure if he said it. Nobody really knows. But uh, this famous quote you may have heard, uh, namely that if the American left is asked to form a firing squad, it gets into a circle. Uh, and I think this is a problem that we're seeing, especially among progressives, uh, that there's so much infighting, you know, so much calling each other out, you know, uh, without much of a sense of how we can actually build a common push here together uh push things forward uh and of course uh, this is what you have to do in the capitalist scene when capitalism reigns supreme not just over the planet but uh, really not just economics and politics but over culture religion uh, personal life and so on so so it's that question what what would that be uh what i'm saying here first of all uh we don't have to copy the right here there's some other alternatives and and that's where it gets exciting Sure, sure, a a absolutely. Want to um, respond briefly there, and then want to bring uh, Dr. Kauser in here. Um, I'd love how you talk about um, again. Make sure y'all dig into the text, Chapter Four: uh, Force Homogeneity, Unite and Conquer. I, I think we, we see versions of this now. That we've kind of set the table and distinctions between uh, a kind of Sheryl uh, Sandberg lean in approach to feminism on the one hand. And what a bell hooks, uh, the late bell hooks called us toward into in terms of a feminism that centers um, the dignity, the lived experiences, the autonomy of of women, as well as pushing against white hetero patriarchal imperial capitalism. Those are different ways of envisioning solidarity. 
um, we might also point to um, some distinctions between uh, the kind of solidarity that seeks to um, acquire wealth and assimilate into uh, capitalism and maybe have a sprinkling of diversity and a sprinkling of inclusion and a sprinkling of, of equity, uh, but doesn't seek to fundamentally shift those root causes and those social determinants that reproduce exploitation, reproduce oppression, uh, reproduce um, estrangement, uh, such that we're severed from our agency and the deepest aspirations for, for equality and justice. Um, and so I want you to, to, to lean in here and, and um, maybe in this particular way, if I, if I can invite a particular invitation to the dance floor. You, you talked about your work in doing congregational renewal and congregations as sites for solidarity. Uh, and as many of us can attest, congregations are both sites for, uh, as a as a co-pastor, I certainly can speak to this, um, sometimes leaning into the rich, beautiful, deep solidarity, but sometimes we see some of this unite and conquer in churches and parachurch networks and denominational networks. So how do you think as a scholar, as well as an organizer and pastor about combating some of these false solidarities in ecclesial and communal networks? Interesting question. Um, I, I, so I'm just gonna make some broad claims here. I think for much of the white expression of Christianity in this nation, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant was really founded on a false consciousness uh, and, and was founded on uh, the supremacy of whiteness. Number one, I don't think we've ever, and we certainly are not now out of it. We are not out of the supremacy of whiteness in our churches in the main, which is part of why it's dying. Um, number one. Number two, there is a class consciousness uh, or, or oh, I think the word may be awareness that is resonant in many mainline and Catholic and Orthodox churches that are primarily middle class and maybe slightly upper middle class congregations with some of them being upper class congregations. And I think that that along with race, class and race, together create a powerful false consciousness that works against solidarity. The way we see that, the way I see that primarily is through the, def always the default is to charity. It is almost always to charity. Yeah. It is almost never to justice. And to talk about justice, I, I, I sound like a wild-eyed Marxist. If I, if I bring up justice uh, in churches, because the consciousness that combines race and class is so powerful and so deep. So in order in my mind to get to, to even approximate solidarity, we have to build another consciousness in middle-class churches. And I'm saying this is true for white churches, but it's also true, I think, in many instances for racial ethnic congregations. Black churches are not off the hook on this. Um, and this is where I struggle, how to build that consciousness with congregations. Building that, for me, is the gateway between charity and justice. If the consciousness can be, the current one can be deconstructed and reconstructed, uh, then I think we have transformative ministry and we may have our young people come back to us because they see something other than the same old thing. The other piece of it is that churches are still today, even in their diminished status, one of the most organized groups in the United States. We don't have to conjure up organizing in congregational life. We just have to organize organizations. 
And that is, um, that keeps me in. The third and final thing that keeps me in is Jesus. Um, and because I think Jesus' work with the disciples and with women and children was really about building solidarity and um, confronting power, confronting oppressive power. And this is where I'm trying to help churches get to. If, if we have any hope of getting at poverty in this nation, of making sure that there are no poor among us, we have to deal with this consciousness that's false. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that hits spot on in so many ways. Um, and as we prepare to transition into some of the distinctions between solidarities organized around power and solidarities organized around privilege, uh, it is Advent after all. Uh, and I think a part of how we can keep justice in the picture, a part of how we can keep power analysis in the picture is, is really to take a cue from womanists, from uh, the best of Latin American liberation theologians and center Mary's Magnificat. When Mary talks about uh, the hungry being filled with good things, the rich being sent away empty, the mighty being pulled down from their thrones and the humble being exalted, you, you can't get away from the asymmetries and the power analysis and the antagonisms in society that Mary clearly names. And you also see appeals to mercy. You also see praise in there. So some of the dichotomies that we accept in our churches, that praise is over here, um, deeply informed class struggle is somewhere else. Mary's Magnificat insists on a sacred and subversive synthesis, uh, which is important to recover at Advent. You want to transition um, to you to, to, to talk a bit about how we parse through solidarities that may appear to be the same, but but you argue provocatively that, that they're in fact, uh, and convincingly different things. Wait, wait in here, please. So if if you think about what we're now saying, and I, I really agree agree with what Angela just said about uh, this, uh, you know, false consciousness of, of race and class, um, a lot of this white supremacy thing that we're dealing with. And I mean, this is, uh, of course, when you say it's false consciousness, people think it's therefore not so serious. It's very serious. I mean, it's one of the big issues of our time. Uh, but by identifying it as false consciousness, what you're saying is, you know, uh, a lot of white people uh, that feel uh, boosted by white supremacy are actually fooling themselves. So, so this is where I make a distinction between privilege and power. White privilege is real. There's, there's no discussion here. It's not to say, oh, well, it's not real or it's not that important. It is very important. It is very real. But white privilege does not necessarily translate into white power. And so this is the organizing thing, right? This is why uh, the right is using this false consciousness in order to build power. Of course, it's not the power of all white people, but it's the power of the dominant ruling class. So, so this is one example for how privilege and power can actually be fruitfully distinguished. It's not to say that one or the other only matter, uh, but privilege does not equal power. Now, you can see this better when you uh, have a bit of a class analysis, when you realize that uh, you may have white privilege, but you don't have very much power because in order to change something in this capitalist scene, you have to have class power. I mean, there is no other way around it. Uh, you know, simply speaking truth to power is not all that helpful because at the end of the day, you may have the truth and they still have the power. So it's those kinds of things we have to think about. And so realizing, uh, of course, uh, not just for, uh, you know, sort of working class people, the way we generally characterize them. And don't forget the working class is always the majority, no matter how you count. We're not talking about minorities here. We're talking about the majority. But even academics, uh, you know, pastors, middle class people, people like us, um, oftentimes fool themselves because we do have some class privilege. I have some class privilege for sure as a elite Vanderbilt professor, uh, but that too does not translate into power. And I think that's where the confusion lies. You know, there is class in terms of privilege. This is the status thing. You know, Angela talked about the upper middle class and the lower middle class. And this is the way we usually think about class. 
But the class analysis, that's the basis of my argument. This is, by the way, chapter three of the book, if anybody wanted to read it. Um, chapter three is absolutely necessary because class is not just a matter of, you know, shoveling around privilege and what kind of car do you drive? Do you drive a midsize Audi or a smaller or larger Audi or Mercedes or whatever Cadillac? Uh, the question is power. And there, of course, we have to talk about something that Americans, for some reason, usually do not talk about it. Even when people talk about class, they do not talk about the distinctions of power. And so the middle class then gets fooled thinking that they are much closer to the ruling class. Uh, while in reality, when you do a power analysis, that's of course not true. You know, your middle manager is always uh, <laughs> the one uh, who has to do the dirty work uh, and who does not have the power of the ultimate boss and even the ruling class. You know, you can think about who's the ruling class. Well, people who own something, people who actually have some monetary weight uh, and so on but it's a matter of power it's not just a matter of money so so once you think about it this way uh, you now have a critical way of thinking about how to cut through these false consciousnesses so even class here uh, i think is a problem if the middle class basically thinks it is in bed with the ruling class why do so many middle-class Americans vote against their own interests? Well, because they have a shitty class analysis. They don't realize that the system is not working for them. Of course, it gives them some privilege. It gives them some comfort. Uh, but that's usually short-lived uh, and oftentimes based on credit, uh, which is the same thing. You know, it's sort of fooling people thinking uh, that they are more uh, than, than they really are. So, so this sort of a privilege thing... Um, has to be squared off with the question of power. So class, uh, or sorry, solidarity built on privilege is usually fooling people, fooling yourself also is this false consciousness. Solidarity built on power is asking the question, who is moving this country? Who is moving at what level? And there, it will be a root awakening for the middle class to realize we're not it. They don't care. I can, as a professor, stand in my bully pulpit or at a great lectern, you know, or a pulpit overlooking a big church, and nothing changes, even if I speak with a loud and deep male, white, European <laughs> voice. It does not make a difference. Uh, once you realize that, of course, that's a little rude awakening. Uh, but I think this is what these middle class Christians need, Angela, that you're working with. They need to realize the ruling class doesn't give a shit. Uh, and why should they, right? Uh and of course, this is not a matter now of feeling bad about yourself or the Olympics of oppression or saying middle class people have problems too. It's simply a very hard nosed analysis who's moving what. And once you realize it, this is where I'm going with this. Once you realize it, uh, then you can actually build power differently. You can now use your privilege to actually build some power with people that you were not supposed to connect with. You can deconstruct your privilege. Of course, it doesn't go away. That's the point of deep solidarity. It's not a matter of sameness. It's a matter of working together, putting our differences to constructive use. Uh, but in a way, uh, that does a power analysis where the middle class finally realizes we can only win this thing if we work together. And the working class finally realizes uh, we are the majority. And uh, ultimately, those of us who have to live to work for a living are the 99%. So this is a little complex. But what I'm saying here is uh, finally doing a real power analysis can make the difference. And what I'm also saying is we're usually not doing that. We're usually getting stuck in the privilege conversations till the cows come home. Uh, but in order to do a class analysis, of course, you need to have some, oh, sorry, in order to do power analysis, you have to have a class analysis and you have to talk about the sort of things that we usually do not talk about. So, so that's where, where this is pushing. No, no, that, 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 that makes ton, tons of sense and, and really appreciate the, um, careful uh, d d distinctions you draw between privilege and power, uh, and and the particularly uh, illustrative uh, if you scream and shout at at the top of your, your lungs, uh, in a white male European voice, not taking into account the power dimensions, it's not necessarily going going to shift things. I'm putting on my po political science hat a bit, um, your your comments make me think of uh, E. Franklin Fraser's uh, text, the Black Bourgeoisie. Uh, Franklin was a Howard uh, University trained sociologist, and he talks about, uh, I think, a challenge that we see, uh, if I can uh, engage in a bit of self-criticism for a bit, a collective community self-criticism, wherein you have 
privilege, particularly among Black folks, without the power analysis, without the class analysis, collapse into discussions around economic mobility, around buying back the block, around Black capitalism. And so Frazier does this long survey of Black business leagues and their connection to Booker T. Washington and philanthropy. If we come together, noblesse oblige, it'll, it'll save us. And, and his critique is that that kind of privilege analysis and aspirational shifts of capitalism is the land of make-believe, is what he calls it. He, he calls it essentially just kind of dreaming and envisioning a world that is so untethered from the best of a kind of historical materialism, which, which doesn't necessarily take off the table questions of incarnation, but I, I think he is pressing the point that uh, we have to ground our work for justice, for uh, a kind of freedom struggle in the material facts of, of the world as we find them. Uh, so really appreciate you calling us to pull apart some of those distinctions. We, we have a question in the chat that I want to, to bring um, to, to you, Angela, and, and yours. Feel free to, to hop in here um, as, as well. Uh, two questions, in fact. Um, I'll, I'll put the first on the table now, and then we'll, we'll save it for the next one uh, for Q&A. And as I'm pausing parenthetically here, I do not see enough questions in the chat. So I wanna give a succinct appeal for you all to bring your questions to the table. What are organizing problems you have had with holding people together? Have you experienced challenges trying to get a one-on-one -on, -one on the books, trying to get someone to take the often difficult plunge to uh, join a attempt to unionize, to take part in an effort to um, go beyond just calling their elected official and moving into sustained conversion type of commitment to, to organizing. Uh, so the question on the table, Angela, I'll, I'll, I'll direct it to you first. Um, Brett puts the question on the table. What do you think about this idea of the church as the Christ-centered practice of nonviolent solidarity? Uh, and solidarity may be doing a, a, a good amount of work here, uh, but that's a vision of church that is on the table. So if I can maybe kind of thread the questions a, a bit here together, um, or thread the second part of the conversation. Is it possible, and what would it look like to have church move forward the religion of Jesus with a nonviolent solidarity that is more connected to Mary's vision of the Magnificat more connected to solidarities around power and not so much about let's have people from every nation and tongue around the Eucharist and all of the distinctions of oppression and inherited silencing of folks voice across gender identity across so many different lines of difference we, we can just kind of forget about the questions of, of, of power and difference does that make sense I, I, I did a bit of blending so happy to restate the question if, if needed so uh, York says in his book in chapter four uh, and in quoting other people that racial solidarity is greater than class solidarity. That is true. Um, and th that's the first thing. The second thing is how do you define violence? Um, not having enough affordable housing and forcing people to pay 50% of their take-home pay you know, is, is violent. Um, that's violence because it means people don't eat, they don't get their medicine. That's what that means. That's what Corinne paying Scott people, said. Pay, paying people below a living wage when we know what the numbers need to be in order for people to make ends meet is violence. Okay. It's not just a gun or a knife or a bomb. It's not at all just that. It is in it, and it even is in churches where you don't pay your pastor enough for him or her for them to make ends meet. That is violence. Okay. So before we go outside pointing fingers at other people, we need to get our own house in order. And our house is not in order. It is not in order. So the second point is around defining violence, okay? The third one, 
Andrew gets back to this issue of false consciousness. We have people in this nation and, and what I call sort of silent suffering. Mm -hmm. We have people in this nation today, tonight, the majority of whom are paying 30, 40, 50, 60% of their take home pay in rent, in rent or yeah. in a mortgage if they can if they can manage to get one. And yet I don't see I don't see the organizing around it. I don't see the anger around it. I don't see the rage around this exploitation and it gets back to what York was saying around the people at the very, very top and we're talking Wall Street fund managers, head fund managers, and all these people that come into communities, buy up real estate and jack up prices, which takes all kinds of people out of the market, which means that lots of things that you can do, you can no longer do. So this false, so there's a false consciousness, I think, around older people in our churches who have their homes and younger people who can't get a home, they can't get in the market. And we, and there's no, I don't know where the solidarity is to organize around this. To, this is where we need solidarity. This is a material, practical issue that leaves people homeless, near homeless, couch surfing, poor, never able to, to get out of it. And I don't know where the imagination and organizing is around building enough affordable housing for people to live in so that they can live in dignity. So I'm talking about something very, very practical here around where we absolutely need solidarity, which I call organizing. And I don't think there's any such thing as nonviolence in the church. I think that's a say, fallacy. Say, say, say more about that. If, if wake me up when the supremacy of whiteness is denounced in our church, wake me up. Wake me up, as York says at the end of uh, chapter five, uh, when a reparations program and pattern is set in this nation for disinherited people and the descendants of disinherited people. And it is these very issues, I think, mm -hmm. that eat at young people who have said, look, this thing is no different than the rest of this corrupt stuff out here. This is and this, I get back to this false consciousness. This for me, Andrew, is the stumbling block that pastors and, but for pastors to work on this means they lose their job. Un unless I would say um, they can create a different sort of consciousness. And I think it's possible. I mean, that that's of course what we're talking about. So if you think about the things you just described, Angela, uh, that are hating people. This this is stuff that's real. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, there was one question of somebody uh, in a small rural church, uh, you know, what, what would this look like? Well, uh, the thing is, um, people who are in on the same church bench uh, would ultimately have to realize that, that what's going on here is actually not just uh, what's happening to the least of these, but it's ultimately what's happening to all of us because they're coming for your house too, you know, eventually, yeah. uh, and for your retirement accounts and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. So, so if if you sort of overlook it and think all we have to do is help some poor people, of course you'll be mad at your pastor because you think he doesn't care about you. But once you realize that your pastor actually has in mind a much broader maybe the 99% uh, reality, uh, then then you can build some solidarity. And I've seen it happen. I mean, this is what we're doing with our solid, with our solid circles. Solidarity here is not a moral appeal saying you should be in solidarity and woe to you if you don't, uh, but simply an appeal to 
let's wake up and see what's going on. Uh, let's see uh, how what's going on here is affecting us all. So, so that's sort of uh, the next step, but that has to be done in the struggle. So, so this is not a conversation we can have here on a Monday night, but this is where people have to go back in, and I think uh, fight the good fight. Um, and of course, uh, back to class analysis. Uh, I, I say this again: our class analysis is so weak uh, that we usually we use terms like classism, uh, which is sort of the worst misunderstanding of class analysis because it thinks the problem is class stereotypes. We shouldn't yeah, be so prejudiced. Like, you know? yeah, I think that's a, a a powerful point. So often people talk about classism as an issue of prejudice or implicit bias and skip what it is that, that you're talking about. Um, as we transition into deep sound, I would love for you to just kind of pause and, and hang out there for a bit. Why is this kind of truncated sense of class standing in for the much more ro robust work, do, do you think? I'll I'll give you a very practical example from, from what I see in a lot of churches. I mean, I, I, I have been to a lot of churches who love to celebrate diversity and so you know the way they think uh, they have to they, they overcome whiteness is say well everybody's welcome that's the way they they also uh, want to overcome you know sort of uh, um you know the the sort of uh, you know uh, homophobias and so on so well just everybody's welcome once you get to class <laughs> people say i mean i have been told this by pastors we're such a wonderful church we have rich people and poor people sitting in the same pews we're welcoming uh, which is misunderstanding the problem of class. The problem is not rich people having stereotypes against poor, poor people, and they should get rid of their stereotypes, but they. the point is to get rid of class exploitation. Uh, and classism here is sort of covering up uh, this class exploitation because it makes it look like all we're doing is we're dealing with stereotypes. And of course, once you translate that back into race and gender, it's the same thing. All we have to do is overcome racial stereotypes, gender stereotypes, and we'll be fine. Uh, what's always missing then is the um, deconstruction of power rather than privilege. So, so this is where class gets stuck in a privilege analysis with the classism stuff and so on. The real problem here is not let's be more welcoming uh, to poor people and rich people, uh, but let's ask what is it that exploits people. And this is where the working class is really crucial because the great thing about the working class is I already said it's the majority and it is the most diverse class the world has ever seen. So this is not about white people in blue overalls and hard hats. This is really about everybody coming together, realizing that what's affecting us here uh, is not classism and some stereotypes, but hard-nosed power structures that we have to investigate. So when people analyze race, of course, we're now at a point where everybody sort of knows or should know that race is not just about prejudice, but prejudice plus power. Uh, well, uh, what if class were the same thing, right? It's not just about prejudice, but prejudice plus real power. And now we have to talk about what does that power look like? How do we deconstruct it? And very practically, this is the point again of the solidarity circles. You can do that in a local situation where you do a power analysis and you see where power flows. And for a lot of white middle class people, especially, but black middle class people too, this is a rude awakening because they have to figure out for themselves uh, that the system doesn't care about themselves, uh, doesn't care about them or their survival or their families or all the things that they usually think are going on. Yeah, no, that that, that hits in, in so many ways. Um, but a, a part of the, the challenge that, that I think also comes to mind is how easily um, once, and I'm, I'm thinking of um, uh, Sekhvan Ber Berkovich's work on the American Jeremiah, um, uh, his point being that things that were once radical can be turned into co-optation just a generation later. So in the 60s, it was radical for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to say, we want to redeem the soul of the country. But now that's the tagline for the commander in chief. We need to redeem the soul of the country. And there is nothing like participatory democracy, like deep class analysis, like the kind of um, undoing the um, foundations of 
land theft and wage theft that are the very basis of, of, of wealth uh, in, in America, not to mention uh, in nation states across the, the, the country. And so I think- and, and, labor, and labor theft, that always goes hand in Absolutely. hand, land theft uh, and, and the, the theft of the working power of billions and billions of people of and, and the planet, not just human, but also other than human. Uh, but but it get, it gets sugared and and sweetened down right by by using kind of civil rights language in order to conceal um the kind of bait and switch and the exploitation so 100% labor theft land theft um also despoiling of the environment uh as, as well as as you call us to and so you were you were about to to, to hop in here but yeah, you to, I, I, yeah. I again i i have a sense that to, to, to go where we're going in a, in a, in a congregation um, has to be, it cannot be a theoretical conversation. It has to be rooted in the ground on some issue, some concern, some problem, some suffering that those people in that church are experiencing first. In other words, I'm not going outside of them. I'm going in them to say, what is hurting you? Yeah. I think that is the crucial point. Exactly. We're in agreement here, Angela. Yeah. Yeah. What is, and then from that issue, let's just keep it on affordable housing and the lack of it. From that very issue, then I can have them do some research on the issues in affordable housing. And once they do some research, then I can inch them into an analysis of power and who are the people that are benefiting from the status quo. And then I can broaden out just like an inchworm into a class analysis. So what I'm saying is that I'm using issues that they are suffering from to do exactly what you were saying to do. And if, if I could add to that, uh, exactly. I mean, I, I'm in total agreement uh, with what you're saying, Angela, and housing is a good place to start. I mean, this is. is something that that everybody experiences. But what always surprises me, and this is where I'm pushing a bit further, is uh, why is labor never coming up, right? We talk about minimum wage, perhaps. We talk about wage theft, too. Uh, but we're not talking about the fact that 99% of us have to work for a living. And, uh, you know, we're so proud of being in the democratic country. There is no, demo for the most part, there is no democracy at work, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not just a matter of how much money you make, but how you're treated as a human being, how you're actually, uh, you know, shaped here uh, by power. Like this, the class relationship is ultimately the, the labor relationship as I define it. Uh, but this is also just as urgent and happening every day. Uh, you could say the bulk of your waking hours uh, you're you're spending at work. And if that's the case, you know, uh, how come we're never talking about labor? I mean, even in the church, you know, uh, I find it much easier to talk about housing and we should talk about it. Uh, but once you get to work, uh, <laughs> people really don't want to quite go there. Uh, maybe people think religion is about leisure time rather than work time. But uh, that that's another misunderstanding. Fred, but, but between the, the these things, and um, as I uh, share a, a bit on this particular point, want to again uh, invite folks to prepare uh, your questions, drop them in the chat, drop them in the Q and A. Uh, as, as a Baptist uh, pastor, I, I believe in multiple rounds of altar calls, so please keep keep the the questions coming. Uh, with respect to to housing and organizing, uh, that's an issue that I've, I've I've done some some work on as well, Angela, so it very much resonates. And, and I think a part of the balance, which is more art than theory or science in some regards, is demanding immediate relief as well as demanding the impossible. And so th there is the need to help folks in terms of, say, eviction de defense, to help folks yes. stay in their homes when they are yes. close to getting thrown out by unscrupulous landlords. But there's also the need to resist the growth machine of capital in so many uh, metropolitan areas that says we'll give subsidies that build huge condos, 70% of it will be quote market rate, 30% will be affordable, but it's not affordable to the people who, to your point, George, who are doing gig work, who are 
uh, perhaps cleaning and constructing the building. And so you have the pretense of income restricted housing that's not actually affordable to working folks or to those who are between work or to those who are coming back from a tenure of correctional supervision. And so part of what demanding the impossible in that context, I think looks like is not settling for subsidies, but permanently affordable housing, reconstructing public housing that is invested in as we once invested in uh, post-war housing, community land trusts uh, that can also be permanently affordable and take um, the land out of the pricing mechanism, out of being commodified, which again gets questions of power back on the table. And to, to frame it, uh, as I think you're beautifully calling us to yours, I think it's actually an expression of theological and pastoral concern to say, do my members of the church or the community, do they have a place to live? That's Are correct. their jobs aligned with the, the National Low Income Housing Coalition says nowhere in the country does the minimum wage get you a two bedroom That's apartment. Correct. That's a wickedness in housing that is underwritten by wickedness in labor unions, if we just gonna keep it a buck, that have sometimes lost their radical fighting spirit. And, and, and George, I think you're calling us to connect these two together to not settle for siloed wins, but to insist on a deep solidarity. Hop, hop, hop in here. We'd love for you to uh, talk a bit there. Um, maybe just quickly, uh, two comments on, on what you just said, uh, Andrew, and then back to Angela's also. Uh, I mean, the housing piece for us uh, is is just as crucial. Uh, we work with the Southeast Center for Cooperative Development, uh, who's uh, incubating worker co-ops, uh, but they're also working on cooperative housing. And so if you think about housing, not just as a place where you have, uh, you know, a roof over your head, but where you have some agency, that that is sort of the big question here. It's, it's not just about having something or property or land, uh, but uh, it is about a place uh, where, you know, your voice comes. It's a place where you have a say, you know, a place where where, where somebody cares, you know, that those sort of things are, are really central. But that is hand in hand with the class analysis via labor that I'm pushing here. By the way, uh, there's a really good question in, in the in the Q&A. If, if I could briefly uh, go to that also, uh, where, where somebody basically Thank wonders whether focusing too much on labor and workers uh, leaves out unemployed people or people with disabilities and so on. Uh, that has to be said always at the same time. This is not just about people either having full-time jobs or working in factories or being able to unionize. This is really about uh, everybody who labors and who labors, well, everybody. I mean, everybody has to do some work uh, to make a living uh, if you're casually or un you know informally employed uh if you're if you're not employed and so on uh, and in fact that's where the solidarity lies because working people ultimately um need each other need each other's agency yet the reality is they're often played off against each other so unemployed people are useful for capitalism because they keep the power structures alive they keep working people down you know uh they make sure uh that uh, there's always some threat you know some sword hanging over people's heads that that uh, you know would kick them out and so on but keep in mind the one thing um no capitalist could ever say only a dead worker is a good worker uh and there is something here uh that has to be explored but the whole point here is not to play off worker and non-workers, but to think about this agency of the 99% uh, that can ultimately make a difference. And that's the point of deep solidarity. So, so solidarity here is not, as I said earlier, primarily about identity, but it is about, uh, first of all, understanding that uh, the system puts us in the same boat. Uh, but for that reason, we also have some agency because the system needs us to some degree, more or less, uh, but that counts. So, for instance, uh, you know, take this back to the Apostle Paul's image of Christ. Take your text, yours. Take your text. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> no, I, I was just encouraging you to, to take your text. So go ahead, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, uh, well, uh, so this is 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 26, right? Well, the, the whole 1 Corinthians 12 part then goes on talking about the body of Christ. Uh, and, and what Paul's doing is, uh, you know, picking up a solidarity image in the Roman Empire that was built on identity, uh, where, you know, 
<laughs> identity is an organic relation. You can be really poetic about this, uh, but but basically keeping the power structures alive. And what Paul is doing is turning this back from its head on its feet, in the end saying, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. So so the struggle here uh, really is built from the bottom up. Uh, that's what I mean by solidarity. It's not to say, oh, we're all alike and we all have all these common features, but we are all experiencing these struggles together. This is what welds us together. This is why you don't need morality to pull people together uh, you just need to wake up and see what it is you know uh, as the union say an injury to one is an injury to all and that's not a philosophical point that's not a point to say well you know you should feel it too but always be aware uh, they'll be coming for you also I mean this is what they realized too late uh, my German ancestors in the Third Reich you know they they were coming for all kinds of people uh, 12 million got killed in concentration camps including a lot of people on the left, socialists, communists, uh, you know, uh, labor people, uh, queer people, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's not something we're talking about much, but these were all eradicated. Uh, why? Well, because this solidarity is dangerous. So, so what welds us together then in this deep solidarity is really uh, the system that exploits us. And that goes, that goes beyond humanity. You could say it's the 99% working for a living, but it's also the non-human world, you know, the exploitation doesn't stop with humanity. This is the problem uh, why we have an environmental crisis, not because people don't love nature, but because it's this exploitation machine. So once you realize that we're welded together in, in a certain way, um, by the way, uh, individualism here is simply a smokescreen. This is the other problem. You know, people think we're so individualistic. Of course, uh, that's what the powerful want to tell you. Uh, while in reality is this exploitation machine is not individualistic at all. It is built on exploitation. And therefore, the person at the very top that usually presents themselves as the greatest individual is really the most connected person of all. Very strange if you think about it this way. All of that you can learn uh, by doing a bit of class analysis and theological analysis, because now the question is, where is God in all of this? Is God the ultimate moralist, you know, that moves us into the field and preaches to Christians, you should do this and you should help the poor? Or is God actually there in the struggle uh, with the people who are experiencing these things and also creating resistance? So resistance here is not just protesting and pushing back, but it is building alternatives. It is using what little privilege and maybe a little bit of power you have in the system to build an alternative. That's solidarity. And for that, you do not yeah. need identity. You actually need diversity. Um, Racial diversity, gender, sexual diversity, religious diversity are not just things that are to be tolerated here, but you need it to build. You need this to really build this new world uh, where everybody has some agency. It's, that's what it's all about. So the text I want to go to is Nehemiah chapter five, which is the foundational text for organizing. You have a, an elite in the person uh, and work of Nehemiah, who is rightly focused on rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem in order to protect the people from all kind of outside invaders and uh, and uh, killing and raping and all of that. And he, that work is going successfully. It's going well. It, and it's extremely well organized in chapters one through four. In chapter five, all of that is interrupted by primarily a group of women who say to Nehemiah, you're busy building this wall, thank you. But we are selling our children into prostitution and slavery in order to have enough to eat, in order to pay the mortgage, these crazy mortgages uh, we demand that this stop and we will no longer sell our children into slavery. We are not going to do that. And Nehemiah turns around and says, yes, let me call a meeting of all of the bankers and all of the people who are lending money, who are charging you 800% interest. 
and they will stop that. And we will get public commitments from them to stop doing that and we'll get it in writing. So there's your power analysis, your class analysis, your relational meeting, your people, poor people from the bottom up, your talks about bottom up, people from the bottom up confronting their own religious leadership to say, we will no longer, you are building this wall. We will no longer sell our children into slavery. And this is what you will do. So that to me is your cause is solidarity. I call it self-interest. Yeah. And what I and what I'm trying to figure out is how do we organize white people outside of that racial consciousness for five minutes to join with other people who are also struggling with housing to confront Pharaoh, to confront the money people with a plan and a program for what we do want. That's where I am. You cannot do it without self-interest. So I, I think, uh, I mean, I in in the chapter actually, I'm 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 talking about that a bit too because solidarity needs this. You know, the selfless solidarity is the solidarity ultimately that cannot be trusted because you don't have a stake in it. So so you know, well-meaning white people, middle-class people putting themselves on the side of poor people. That's great. It's better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to make light of it. Uh, but this is the solidarity that ultimately cannot last. So so it has to be connected to some sort of self-interest, which is different from selfishness. Uh, but that self-interest has to do with the fact uh, that uh, one has to analyze the system in such a way to realize that the system is also coming for you. The system is actually not benefiting you. Uh, there was one question actually in the chat where somebody says, uh, um, talks about uh, anger and solidarity, uh, anger and uh, resentment against the capitalist class. Well, uh, don't think about the capitalist class as individuals, you know, Bezos or Bill Gates or even Elon Musk, you know, uh, because these people are all replaceable. Uh, the point of the capitalist class is not uh, that they're mean capitalists that we should hate. Uh, in the end, you know, uh, somebody in that function, uh, you know, somebody else can always come. You know, if a CEO decides I will no longer serve the ruling class, well, somebody else will be CEO the next day. So in this sense, uh, you know, the self-interest, uh, even for the ruling class, might mean that... Uh, just giving you a comfortable life it's giving you some powers giving you a say uh but it might actually destroy you too you yourself your family uh and we're seeing it i mean uh this is why the well-known adage uh, rich people have problems too well of course i mean this this machine uh will eat you up also so so this self-interest i think is is the wake-up call angela that that we're both looking for in addition to um anger and self-interest, I, I think it's important to get the question of anti-imperial imagination on the table for a few reasons. One, it's possible to have the kind of solidarity that gets us much of what we want from a domestic policy lens, but for that solidarity to be based on a neo-colonial relationship with countries in the global south. And so, so much of the best of solidarity that we've seen domestically in the States and some of the Nordic countries uh, has been premised on commodity relationships, debt relationships, um, the primitive moment of accumulation in particularly Latin American and African nations, such that if we don't have that internationalist view that I think the best of Christian tradition calls us to, the best of the labor movement calls us to, and I think even the best of um, kind of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging analysis calls us to, to some of that as well. Um, but that anti-imperial vision of dethroning the mighty and power being rooted literally in, in people uh, and not being something that is hoarded or always deferred to when it's consolidated in nation states, I think is absolutely critical. And so, so with pair. The, the need for anti-imperial imagination as opposed to imagining our solidarity based on our passport. 
uh, that, that that's critical to, to get us, I think, to, to it, where we need it, to go. it really is, Andrew. I, I just want to underscore that this this is really so important. I I, I sometimes say to my students, you know, you tell me what is uh, what is the opposite of socialism? Of course, they're well, capital and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's one way to put it. Uh, but another opposite of socialism is national socialism. Uh, it's, it's not just a sort of a narrow form of socialism, but it is the absolute perversion and distortion built on a colonial imperial project. Uh, you know, uh, a sort of uh, misguided self-interest. People might say, well, no, that's national selfishness. Well, it is, uh, but it's not even healthy self-interest from within. And so so this sort of national uh, focus there, I mean, Christian nationalism is another thing that we're talking about these days, really has to be addressed in terms of uh, how it actually even hurts the people that embrace it. And I think this goes back to how we deal with the middle class in the church. One has to help people to understand um, that uh, they too are not winning this game. And this is where I, I mean, I, I, I put this uh, to Reverend Barber once in a while. I wish that the poor people campaign uh, would actually embrace some of these broader solidarity analyses rather than calling people to arms uh, for good moral reasons. Those are all good reasons. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but to bring some of the self-interestedness, to bring some of this deeper sense of solidarity as to how are we actually connected? How is the system welding us together? Sometimes the un unions have great sayings. You know, one of them is the boss is our best organizer. Think about that. And, and so, um, Andrew, before you, you hop in, um, just want to do a quick time stamp. So we're coming at about 8.45. So, Andrew, if you could actually kick us off with uh, any uh, calls to action, closing remarks, um, I'll go next. Yours will let you get uh, the last word. And thank you all so much for, uh, for being with us. It's been a fantastic conversation, and we want to make sure we're making the intentional pivot uh, from discussion into actionable uh, movement work. Yeah. So uh, in the world as it should be, 10,000 trained organizers would be on the ground in the United States right now, organizing around shared interests and self-interest to counteract the profound uh, power of the right, which is about crushing, killing, destroying um and that's not rhetoric that is reality that is coming in this nation precisely because we don't have the solidarity this that we that on the left that we need to counteract that which is on the right so given that we don't have 10,000 trained organizers on the ground uh, in the United States today, working on organizing the left. Um, what I know to do is to, to work as hard as I can to lift the veil in churches and congregations and to trust the spirit to uh, for repentance for repentance uh, because ultimately to get to justice, that's kind of what we need along with power and a willingness to use power on behalf of ourselves and people who suffer in this land and around the world. In the meantime, we publish in the bias, Winland Cook does its work and I would be interested in hearing what the audience says needs to be done. We have roughly a year before we have the next election. And the predictions are that we are moving to fascism, dictatorship, and authoritarianism. So this is a real question as to what is our response to this, that's a question. A question and, and, and an invitation. Uh, we, we invite folks to drop into to the chat uh, what you think needs to be done. That's not only a, a question of 
Lennon and so many others, you can can pose your own uh, response to that question, what needs to be done in the chat, or uh, if you want to pose it in uh, the Q&A box, we, we certainly welcome that. Uh, I would be remiss, uh, George uh, took a text, uh, Angela took a text earlier, I'd be remiss <laughs> if I didn't uh, take a text uh, as well and, and some closing remarks. Um, what stands out for me um, in this conversation and in, in many ways is um, actually, uh, George, is, it's in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, around the seventh verse, New Revised Standard Version. Um, the, the manifestation of the spirit is given to each for the common good. And I think it's important to talk about an asset-based, strength-based view of what we can all do together. All of us here on this Zoom room, all of those who are in our uh, networks, rather than assuming a certain kind of charisma is necessary for justice work, rather than assuming a certain kind of celebrity or influencer account, rather than assuming one has to be a judge or a senator or present to get stuff done. The theological analysis of power and the demos is that we each have a kind of genius, what, um, goodness gracious, Brother Vincent Lloyd calls democratic charisma, uh, that the gifts and the charisms are in the people. Uh, and that I think is important because it serves as a bridge to help us uh, ask more from um, the state on an interim basis, even as we are doing more mutual aid, doing more solidarity circles, doing more deep belonging and internal community that we're trying to do with ICS so that we can have the kind of public investment in worker co-ops, the kind of public investment we need in public banks, the kind of investment you need in solidarity economies uh, that is not a silver bullet, uh, but that takes back what, in fact, already belongs to us so that we can then, uh, with those gifts, with that strength, with that, I'm going to even throw out this word because I feel Pentecostal tonight, with that anointing that we have, we can assemble ourselves into more powerful and efficacious coalitions. We have that power. Let's activate. Yours? Yeah, wow. Well, yeah, I mean... Uh... More power uh, to you and to all of us. I mean, this is the power of the Holy Spirit also, uh, if you wanted to do the theological work, uh, that that is always a resistant spirit. It's never sort of this dominant spirit of triumphalism that, that we see so much. Um, I, I want to pull a few things together. We're getting a lot of good feedback on, on the chat also, and there's still Thanks some questions on the, on the Q&A uh, that are also important. Uh, but Andrew, a minute ago, you talked about the common good. I mean, this is what we're all about. I mean, Angela's, of course, uh, in, in that struggle as well. Uh, deep solidarity is about the common good. Uh, but my main point here is uh, in order to build this solidarity, we do not need to start with great moral appeals. We do not need to start with uh, all kinds of identity schemes. Uh, we simply need to look where the common pain is. So, so you sort of dig deeper, you ask, uh, where is it that people are hurting? And we've already talked about examples, housing, work. Uh, I mean, there's some- uh, Addiction, addiction. addiction. Uh, there's uh, debt, debt is mentioned yeah. several times now in the chat. So, so those things point uh, to something uh, that is, very deep uh, and to some degree affects all of us. Now, here I would say this is something I haven't said yet. That's very important for deep solidarity. You really need to dig as deep as possible. So, so simply looking at your own pain, this is the self-centeredness is not enough. This is where self unenlightened self-interest is also not helpful just to say what hurts me. But to look at uh, what is happening uh, in sort of uh, at the bottom of society, where, where is it that people get hurt the most. And that's, of course, where issues of race, gender, sexuality, and class all come together. That's where we have to pay attention. I mean, this is, of course, what we're learning gradually now. You look towards Palestine. What are we learning? You know, you really have to look at the bottom. Uh, somebody in the Q&A asked about uh, Guy Standing's concept of the precariat. I think that's helpful because uh, we, we cannot simply think of poor people of people that don't have much money. If you want to do an analysis in the university system where I spend a lot of my time, you need to look at the adjuncts. It's not even the students. It's the adjuncts that cannot afford apartments these days. You know, the oftentimes adjuncts may have a PhD and all this wonderful privilege, uh, but 
but uh, they may earn less than your average cafeteria worker. Uh, those are the questions of deep solidarity. And if the faculty doesn't realize this, if they think the adjuncts are just, you know, people that they can forget about, uh, unfortunately, this is what happens all the time, even among progressive faculty. They feel more uh, in tune with the administration, their presidents and whoever at the top, their boards, um, their trustees, then uh, with the adjuncts. Uh, I mean, we had this conversation recently, my own faculty, you talk about class, everybody thinks about students, very important conversation, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of struggle there as well, but nobody mentions the adjuncts and nobody then uh, thinks that we may have something uh, in common because as goes the adjunct, so goes the academy. Uh, and this is why a lot of our own jobs are getting more and more in trouble. So think about it this way. You start looking at where the pressure is greatest, but then you start looking for agency. So this is not looking for a complaint or uh, always protesting and criticizing. You look for where the thing actually starts growing. And this is what we're also seeing. We see now people organizing in a way that we haven't seen before. I see a lot of uh, comments about a, a strike a debt strike in the chat, that's great. Uh, but think about what the actual workers have done now. Uh, of course, you can never have a strike without solidarity. Uh, this is why this gap is such a problematic figure, of course. Uh, but it's happening. I mean, it's happening all over. And uh, this is no longer just sort of the idealists talking among themselves, uh, but it has to be tied back to the actual agency of working people. And by working people, again, we mean everybody. Uh, who has to work to stay alive, which is basically all of us. Uh, so it's those kinds of things, I think, that give me hope. Uh, in other words, where you see the oppression greatest, you also have to look for the agency. And the fact that we're seeing a lot right now, I think, is almost as encouraging as anything I've seen in a long time. And um, yeah. now you ask the theological question, finally, uh, do we find God in any of this? And if we don't, you know, then forget about your religion. Uh, <laughs> it may not be uh, what gets you anywhere. But uh, if we do, well, then let's do our theological homework. Let's practice our religion. Let's do what needs to be done in our faith communities. And that doesn't have to be a Christian thing only. Uh, that could be uh, very well a multi-religious thing where people see that the gods they're worshiping doesn't have all to be the same. Uh, but they're somehow all in the struggle, whether this is the Jewish God of Abraham, whether this is the Muslim God, you know, uh, whether this is the Christian God, uh, no need to claim identity there either, uh, but see what they're doing, see what's happening in the world um, and see if that gives us the boost that we need. I think it might. So what I want to leave you with very quickly is that we pierce the veil in congregations where everything is okay, where there's a mask that people wear uh, to hide pain and suffering and disenfranchisement, to pierce that veil pastorally, and then to join the pain that is revealed in the congregation with the pain in the community is where I wanna be. If I'm not there, then I'm in a charity position. The organizing position is to figure out what's going on with our own people in our own house and join that with what is going on and people who are working on this in the community. That is how solidarity for me is built practically on the ground. And, and adding to that, that organizing is very different from mobilizing. Yes. I think yeah, this is what a lot of people confuse. Uh, and again, I mean, just uh, agreeing with what you're saying, Angela, because uh, I mean, for those who don't know, um, we're actually working together on some of these things quite a bit uh, through what's happening in the Winland Cook program. Then there's also the Black Mountain School Black of Mountain. Theology that's that's doing great that's work. Right. Uh, right. and, uh, and and right. individual enterprises. But that that is the point. Uh, mobilizing uh, the sort of stuff that we thought would ultimately get us there is, is not enough. No. Organizing goes very deep and it needs a very deep notion of solidarity. I guess this yes, is what I started talking about deep solidarity about a dozen years ago uh, and we're still sort of working on it. So uh, there's more that could be said, but uh, this is that solidarity. I think that gets us somewhere. And people who practice 
and touch deep solidarity in their souls don't go back. They don't go back to alienation. They don't go back. They are changed. They are changed people because of it. And here we could talk about the old uh, holiness traditions, right? Uh, conversion, repentance, come on, uh, come all, on. all the way, all the way to awakening. I mean, this is what I'm hoping for. You know, this is not just can we do a little social project here and there, but uh, could there be an awakening that people are actually waking up and exactly like you're saying, uh, Angela, namely seeing things that they might not have seen yet, but once you see it, you cannot unsee it. You can't unsee it. That's right. But I'll say as, as a um, parting um, comment, uh, yay and amen to uh, awakenings, conversions, and moving from estrangement to deep uh, commitment um, to the work of undoing capitalism and, and power imbalances. Um, the first is that I think there are having a polycentric view of how the struggle for justice and the common good happens, I, I think is essential. And, and I think it's where, where we're going towards. Uh, certainly congregations, certainly um, uh, labor unions and worker centers are important to that. I'm just gonna, gonna go, go out here and say what I think is implicit in a lot of our dinner table conversations. Um, having a legitimate uh, labor party, third party at the local and state level is essential to begin growing the kind of ecosystem that can consolidate whatever wins we're talking about. Once you win something, you need um, an ecosystem to help strengthen and make that work more diffuse. Uh, and then the, the last thing that I'd say is as someone who serves on a labor religion uh, coalition in New York State on the board of directors, uh, there's a special historic relationship, I think, between faith communities and labor unions, the kind of work that we're talking about here with solidarity circles uh, that helps us to amass the kind of durable power, budgets, num numbers that can sustain a quarrel and contention with capitalism across election cycles and across business cycles so that we can win enough and scaffold enough over time to create the kind of world that, that we envision. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, perhaps we have to do this again as ICS and, and the <laughs> Winland Cook program. I'd be remiss to not throw that off the call out there. We'll deal with that later. God bless you all and have yeah. a great evening. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Yes. Uh, and uh, we cannot overemphasize this coalition work. You know, the Wendland Cook program works closely with labor unions, uh, worker cooperative development centers, and so on for those reasons. And of course, faith communities, uh, they need this connection too. Thank you, friends. Well, thank, thanks. Uh, greatly enjoyed it. We'll do more of it. I'm happy. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>